Well, good morning. It's good to see everyone here this morning. We're glad to have so many visitors with us. You have come from far and wide, and we're honored that you chose to be with us. This morning's lesson is entitled, Marriage, Roles and Responses, Part 1. So because of Part 1, next Sunday morning we'll look at Part 2. This morning's text is taken from Ephesians 5, 22 to 33. Last month when we talked about the invitation to the marriage of the Supper of the Lamb, or the Supper of the Marriage Lamb, Marriage of the Supper, the Marriage Supper of the Lamb. When we talked about the marriage of the Lamb as it's referred to in Revelation 19, 7 through 9, and how the church fulfills that role as the Bride of Christ, and we talked about that and how the church is the Bride of Christ, and so that the church is going to be presented to Christ, I had many requests to do a lesson on the family, specifically the, the role of husband and wife and how that becomes into the role of father and mother. And we talked about fathers and mothers over in May and then last month. So to fulfill that second part of that request, to talk about husbands and wives, thought we'd do that over the next course of the next two weeks. Some of the material that I consulted was a book called Preparing for Marriage by Dennis Rainey. On page 163, he says, the Bible sets forth specific and distinct roles for a husband and wife that must be accurately understood and practically fulfilled. No, that is absolutely correct. Before anyone enters into marriage, we ought to have a firm grasp on what God expects us to, to do and what God expects what role for us to fulfill in that marriage. Whether we are the husband or the wife or the potential husband or potential wife, we need to identify what God would have us to do in that relationship. But identifying God-given roles in marriage is rejected by those who are enlightened in our culture today. They don't want to hear what God has to say about a marriage. It has been redefined and redefined over and over and over again just in the last century. Many people, when they're preparing for marriage, many of the marriage counseling today will tell a person or tell two people that marriage is a 50-50 relationship. Well, if you think about that, that means each person is only giving half to make 100%. And that's incorrect. And so then it's no wonder then we read of the staggering divorce statistics in our culture, not just in our nation, but the world over. I was reading some stat that I, I could not verify in, in multiple sources as I like to do, and so I didn't provide it. But one of the statistics I was reading that was saying from ages 18 to 30, there's more people living together than are getting married. Because if they only have to give half in marriage, well, then they might as well only go halfway in the first place, right? So that's what's happening. And this is becoming the norm. Marriage is a 100%, 100% relationship, each with distinct roles and responses that must take place. There's no such thing as a roleless marriage. Every marriage is going to settle into some kind of social and organizational relationship. That's just the way it's going to be. How that marriage settles into one of those roles, it better be in, under God's way. We need to make sure that our marriage doesn't just become any old role, any role that society says is okay, but we need to make sure that our marriage, and for those of you who are not yet married, as you are looking at a potential mate to one day marry, you need to be already thinking of those roles and responses that you need to carry into that relationship. The point is, when roles are confused, marriage is weakened and destroyed, and so often goes with it, the church. Culture portrays wife as the leader, the brain, in some cases even desperate. Culture portrays the husband as incompetent, the brawn, and in most of the cases, the tyrant, the one that the kids and the mom have to subvert and get around to get smart things done, or to get whatever it is that they want to get done, done. But there are God-given roles of husband and wife, and God-given responses to each one of those roles. Today, we're going to focus on the God-given role of the husband, and thus the God-given response of the wife to the husband's role. Next week, we'll talk about the God-given role of the wife and the God-given response to the husband of the role of the wife. But it is critical for those wishing to enter into marriage and for those already married to understand the scriptural roles and responses for marriage to be what God wants it to be. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4, we're told that marriage is to be held in honor. In Hebrews 13 and verse 4, 
It says, Marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled. For fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. So many people today have redefined the word marriage. And it is not held in honor by all. And the marriage bed, even as they call it, has become defiled. But the marriage bed, according to God's rules, and for who He says can be married. In Matthew 19, 1-5, we can read that Jesus said, From the beginning, it was male and female that were to leave, husband, leave father and mother, and cleave one to another, and become no longer two flesh, but one flesh. It's been that way from the beginning. That Jesus laid out in Matthew 19. That a husband and wife, a male and female, are able to get married and to become one flesh. So let's look at the core role of the husband. He is the head of the wife. That is his role in the marriage relationship. He is the head. In Ephesians 5, 23, we're going to read verse 25 and then 28 through 31. So I invite you to open your Bibles with me to Ephesians chapter 5. And we're going to begin reading in verse 23. And don't worry, we'll back up to verse 22 in just a second. But starting with me in verse 23, it says, For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, for him, he himself being the Savior of the body. Then verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. If you jump down to verse 28, it says, So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. For he who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we're members of his body. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. It's important to understand each one of these roles and responses because this analogy given in Ephesians 5 is so closely tied to the relationship between the church and Christ. In fact, Verse 32 tells us that this is what he's really talking about. He's talking about a spiritual truth that can be seen in the physical. So what happens when the marriage relationship is not the way God has designed? See, if it's a mirrored pattern that we can see in the physical, the way God wants to see husband and wife related to each other, and that's how the church relates to Christ, then if the family is messed up, guess what follows next? The church. Because if the family is messed up and we see that as the physical representation of what's happening spiritually between the church and Christ, then we say, then why can't the church look like the families? It's important that we understand the role of the husband as God has given it. Christ is the leader of his body, the church. Ephesians 1, chapter, chapter 1, verse 22. Ephesians 1, verse 22. It says, And he put all things in subjection under his feet. And gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And if you go back to verse 20, he's talking about Christ. So Christ is the head of his body, the church. He loves the church supremely. If you go back and look in verse 25 through 29, as we just read, you see, he loved the church. He gave himself up for her. And husbands, we're told to love our wives in that same way. That means, husbands, we need to love our wife enough to give our lives for her. The husband is the head of the wife and he's to love his wife supremely. Just as Christ gave himself for the church, husbands are to give themselves to their wives. We ought to be willing and ready to sacrifice, even pay the ultimate price if it need be, for our wives. That's the kind of love we're to have for them. The role of head is not a position so many people think of today. That's how the world looks at it. Oh, Man thinks he's more superior than women. And, and the husband is just ruling with an iron fist over his family. No, the role of head is not a position that denotes superiority. But it's a function that demands work. Think of that relationship between the church and Christ. Christ is the head of the church and we talk about it all the time. What is our response to Christ as members of the church? We are to work. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. We're to always abound in the work of the Lord. There is work that needs to be done knowing that Christ is the head. The same happens in a marriage relationship. The head functions out of love for the body. As we just read in Ephesians 5, 25 to 29. And verse 33, and we're going to read this when we talk about the response of the wife. It says, Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife even as himself. And the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. 
The husband must pattern his leadership after the leadership of Christ. I want to thank Greg for the scripture reading this morning and ask you to turn with me there and read it again. Mark chapter 10, verses 42 to 45. This not only applies to discipleship, but knowing that Christ is the head of the church and the husband is told he has the role in the marriage relationship as Christ does over the church, and this is what Jesus said about leadership, then it also applies to how the husband leads his family. So in Mark 10, 42 to 45, it says, Calling them to himself, Jesus said to them, You know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. But it's not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. One of the first and foremost things this passage teaches us is that Jesus was a servant leader. Among all the people that ever walked the earth that could have demanded not just to be served but to be worshipped was Jesus Christ. He was the creator among the created and yet he said he did not come to be served but he came to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. In Ephesians chapter 5 it talks about that saying he gave himself for the church. And that husbands ought to be willing to give themselves for their, to their wives. Jesus lays out the type of leadership that we are to have as disciples one to another. And yes, even husbands to our wives. Jesus' leadership or his rule was service, sacrifice, salvation. It was unselfish. It was not pleasing himself. Look in Romans chapter 15 verse 3. Place a marker there in Ephesians 5. We'll be coming back to it. But in Romans chapter 15, verse 3, it says, For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. And if you go to Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 5, Jesus over and over as we read through the Gospels said that he did not come to do his own will, he came to do the will of the one that sent him. His father, even in the garden, the night that he knew he was about to be betrayed, the night he knew his people were going to hold a mock trial through the middle of the night into the early hours of the morning. Then they were going to hand him over to the Romans to be unjustly accused to be crucified. In his prayer in the garden, he prayed. And then we're told he prayed a fervent prayer that if it was God's will that this cup passed from him. But remember his next phrase? Not my will but your will be done. He did not come to do the things that were pleasing to him or his flesh. He came to do what was pleasing to God. And so we read in Philippians 2, 5, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, or this mind, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be granted, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. He's talking about he left his home in glory. He left his home in heaven. And he came, the creator, taking on the form of the creature. Verse 8, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. Jesus came to serve. He was a servant leader. And we see that in Ephesians 5 and verse 23. In Ephesians 5. In verse 23, as we read earlier, it says, For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. What did it take for him to be the Savior of the body? It took himself taking on the form of a bondservant. And as that form of a bondservant is to be obedient to God, he was obedient even to the point of death on a cross. So we see Jesus' leadership is different than the leadership that we read in the rest of the world. It was service, sacrifice, and salvation. That's how the world has salvation, is because of his leadership. But the Gentiles' leadership was to lord it over, to wield power and be served. Throughout time, this is how the world has viewed leadership. It is to lord it over, to wield immense power, and through that power, cause servants, have people falling hand over feet at your feet, that they might serve you. Jesus says to his disciples, that's not to be your leadership. That's not how you are to lead. And so when we read that husbands are the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, and that's not how Christ led, 
And we see that the husband's role, his leadership, is not the woman, do what I say, approach. But in fact, when we look in Mark chapter 10, 42 to 45, we see two things. We see that to be great, that's the Greek word megas, and it means greatest, mighty, one must be a servant. And that word servant is strong. It's 1249 in the Greek dictionary. It's diakonos. That's so where the word deacon comes from. It means attendant, a waiter, someone that runs the errands. That's the role of a husband as a servant leader. We're to attend our wife. We are to be a servant. And he's Mark 10, 42 to 45. In order to be first, that's that Greek word protos, Strong's 4413 in the Greek dictionary. It means first in rank, first in influence. First in honor. He says, you want to be that? You want to be first? Then you must be a slave to all. Slave is that Greek word, Strong's 1401, doulos. It's bondservant, slave, one who gives himself up to another's will, whether voluntarily or involuntarily. Disregard of self, devoted to another to the disregard of one's own interests. A slave isn't able to attend to their own interests. It goes to their master first. Christ's is the head of the church. He was a servant leader, and we're told that husbands are to be the head of the wife, the head of the family, in the same sense. So husbands, you want to be great? You want to be first? You need to first be a servant. You need to be a slave. We need to serve our families. Be willing to sacrifice, as Christ did, for our families. Being a servant leader does not mean, and before we get into the not mean, I want us to read Proverbs eleven twenty nine. Solomon, in all his wisdom, wrote through the Spirit, writing, He who troubles his own house will inherit wind, and the foolish will be servant to the wise-hearted. He who troubles his own house will inherit wind. Those who practice leadership in the ways we're about to describe are those who will trouble their own house. Being a servant leader does not mean becoming a lording leader, making all decisions himself or selfishly controlling others, so that he can meet his own needs. To those in the back, I don't know how many of you can read this picture I found, but it says, my wife was so sick this morning that I had to carry her to the kitchen to make my breakfast. Being a servant leader does not mean this. This is not the way a husband is to cherish his wife and to love her as his own self. It's not to love his wife as the church or as Christ loved the church. Being a servant leader does not mean that a man must have an outgoing personality and always be ready to rally the troops. That's not what it means. And being a servant leader does not mean that the wife never gives him advice and counsel, etc. Et these are things that are not meant in what it means to be a servant leader. Being a servant leader does mean, and we're going to read two passages, the first of which is in Colossians 3.19. Regarding husbands, it says, Husbands, love your wives and do not be embittered against them. What do you think about the man that had to carry his sick wife to the kitchen to make him breakfast? Was he a little embittered against her? Well, he was inconvenienced. She was sick. Things didn't go the way he was used to. No, we're to love our wives and not be embittered against them. In fact, we see that being a servant leader means taking overall responsibility for the direction of the family, both physical and spiritual, both moral and material. In 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8. In 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8. And talking about the role of husbands. It says, But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he's denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. In Ephesians 6, 4, as we read a couple weeks ago, the, it falls onto the father to raise his children in the instruction and admonition of the Lord. The instruction or correction of the Lord. We are to take overall responsibility for the direction of the family. The physical, the spiritual, the moral, and the material. And being a servant leader means serving the needs of one's wife and family. Taking consideration, being unselfish, and giving diligent attention to our wives and the needs of our children and our family. And we're also told that we are to cherish our wives so that she can become all God wants her to be. In Ephesians 5... <coughs> Back in Ephesians chapter 5, 28 to 29. Ephesians 5, starting in verse 28. It says, So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, 
just as Christ also does the church. Nor in the traditional vows, and I'm not going to say everyone has made this vow because some people have made their own vows and may or may not have chosen to use this word. But in traditional wedding vows, you usually have that word to hold and to cherish, right? Where does, what does that word cherish mean? In the Greek, it's the word thalpo from Strong's 2282 in the Greek dictionary. It means to warm, to foster, and to care for. In other places, in to the first letter in Thessalonians, Paul talked about how he cared for the church there as a nurse would cherish her children. That means care for her children. The idea there is of cherishing is what a hen or a mother duck or any type of bird does to help keep that egg warm to help it to incubate and to grow. Webster says about cherish, it means to treat with tenderness and affection, to give warmth, ease, or comfort to. See, the idea of cherish is it's not just to keep warm. Here's a blanket. Well, I cherished her today. The idea is to hold her close. The idea is to envelop her and protect her and to comfort her and to hold her as tight as possible. Thayer says of this, it means to warm or to keep warm. Husbands are to care for their wives the way Jesus cared for the church, self-sacrificially for her benefit, to be tender and to be her safe place. And the husband is to deny himself and give himself to his wife and family. 1 Peter 3, 7 says, You husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way as with someone weaker since she's a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. This passage has been used and abused by so many in the world today to show that women, that men think that women are weaker, that God thought that women are weaker. No, that's not what he says. He says we're to show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life. She's not inferior to us. A wife is not inferior to the husband. She's a fellow heir of the grace of life, and we better treat her that way. In fact, if we don't, notice what the next part of this passage says, so that your prayers will not be hindered. Husbands, we can treat our wives in such a way that our prayers will not be heard. We need to understand that and realize the way we treat our wives has a direct result on the way God is going to hear our prayers. We don't have the right to treat her as property or something inferior to us. But no, we are to treat her with honor. We are to care for her in a self-sacrificially way. And as a servant leader, we are to take the initiative in the home, to be the spiritual leader, to pray, to worship, to teach God's word, to discipline. So many men leave the discipline up to their wives because they're off at work. The wife is home with the kids all day. And so they say, well, when I get home, I should not have to do any discipline. It should fall onto the wife to have done it all. No, we need to take a part in that. We need to pray with our family. We need to teach them what it is to worship God. Through our example, through practice, to study God's Word, and yes, even to exercise discipline. Place a marker there in Ephesians 5. Look at me in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 9. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 9. This was such a common practice then, it's just taken for granted that this is the way it is. And if the Hebrew writer were here in our world today, he might say, where is the discipline in the home? Our earthly fathers practiced discipline. But today, there's so many things that can go wrong. If you discipline your children, you could be the villain. You could have the state come in and say, no, we need to take them so to make them safer. <clears throat> it does not matter what the world around us does. We have a role. And that is the, the unpleasant part of being a parent, whether you're the husband or the wife, the father or the mother, is discipline. But it must be done. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 9. He says, furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, so that we may share his holiness. And he goes on to say what we all know about discipline, whether we've been on the receiving end or we're on the giving end. He says, all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet, to those who've been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Discipline is necessary. And fathers, we have that role. As husbands, we have that role. To see that to being a servant leader means that we are to be the one to make sure our finances are in order. 
We need to be made, ready to be make sure that our needs of our family are met, that our family is secure. First Timothy 5.8, we need to take care of our household. And we need to ask forgiveness when we're wrong. To resolve conflict and to enhance godliness. We should never, as husbands or fathers, take the attitude that because I'm the head, I don't have to seek forgiveness. <coughs> That I should never have the attitude that because my wife is to submit to me that whether I'm wrong or not does not matter and I don't have to seek her forgiveness. No, we have, just as we to be are in the submission to God and seek His forgiveness, when we are wrong, we need to seek forgiveness. If we don't, it's a pride issue. And there's something greater going on in our lives that might create a barrier between us and God. To be a servant leader, it means to make it easier for your wife to follow your lead. And I want you to look with me in Psalm 128, 1 to 4. In Psalm 128, 1 to 4. It says, How blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. When you shall eat of the fruit of your hands, you'll be happy, and it will be well with you. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine within your house, your children like olive plants around your table. Behold, for thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. It says, like a fruitful vine. It means his wife bore him many children, and she is productive. Children like olive plants. You can imagine there they are clustered around his table like tender olive plants. Full of them vigor and vitality. Life all around him. That's what this is describing. And it says, how blessed is a man who fears the Lord that God would bless him with a family such as this. Men, be the man your wife will want to submit to. Be the man your wife will want to submit to. And ultimately, a man's headship is an issue between the husband and the Lord. Ephesians 5 verse 23. Ephesians 5 verse 23. says, For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. And then husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church, verse 25, and gave himself up for her. This is an issue between the husband and the Lord. And we are going to give an account for how we have been the head of our family, how we have fulfilled that role that we have been given by God. And the next part we want to talk about is God's core response of the wife to the husband's role, and that is a role of, or a response of submission. Ephesians 5, 22 to 24. And we're also going to read 1 Peter 3, 1 to 2, and verses 5 to 6. And I want to put a disclaimer here before we read these passages. The world has such a bad idea as to what it means to be a wife in submission. That we could spend lessons and lessons talking about all the ways it's done wrong today. And what I have focused on, instead of doing that, let's talk about how to do it right. When we see God's pattern, then anything aside from that is not God's will. And it doesn't matter how close it looks or how far away it looks. If it's not in God's pattern, it's wrong and needs to be corrected. So rather than spend time talking about all the ways it's wrong and how the world does it wrong, let's focus on our lives. Let's focus on our relationships and make sure that we are doing it according to God's pattern. And you'll notice that this does not say God's core role of the wife to the husband's role. It's her response to the husband's role, and that is of submission. Ephesians 5, 22 to 24. It says, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. See, the picture that's painted here is it's saying in the physical realm, we ought to be able to understand the spiritual. As the church is the bride of Christ, and we see that as the bride, wives have this similarity to the church, this familiarity with the church. That as the church is subject to Christ, it should be easy for them to stand that the wife is submissive to the husband. In 1 Peter 3, 1 to 2, and in verses 5 and 6, it says, In the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives, as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. For in this way, in former times, the holy women also who hoped in God used to adorn themselves being submissive to their own husbands. Just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become her children if you do what is right, without being frightened by any fear. Well, if you look, if you do a web search for 
wife in submission or submissive wife, you better have your strict filters on for one. You don't know what you're going to see. But if for two, you're going to see the way the world views Christianity as far as this goes. I saw picture after picture depicting a, a submissive wife as a wife being led by a leash by her husband. That they sell Christian wife necklaces and it's a collar with a big ring on it. That's how the world views God's given response for the wife to her husband's rule. They don't want to hear that Sarah obeyed her husband and called him Lord. They want to hear that the wife is able to make all the decisions that the husband can make. Or, as culture likes to say, perhaps even more, and maybe she's even better suited for it. But this is an action of will. Just as Christ, the wife has two examples of submission. They have the church and Christ. Christ was submissive and obedient even to the point of death on the cross. He was submissive to his father. He said, not my will, but your will be done. For the wife, it's an action of will. To be respectful and holy and practice good conduct, 1 Peter 3, verse 2 and 5 to 6, she willingly puts herself under his leadership. And... She is to obey his leadership, 1 Peter 3, 6, and Titus 2, 5. This is a voluntary attitude of giving in, of cooperating, helping with the responsibility and carrying a burden. But it's important to note that submission is not a role. It's her response to the husband's role as a servant leader. Whenever there is a leader and that is the role, the response is submission, not a role. It's submission. The woman's response, the wife's response, is submission. And that submission is in response to his God-given role as a servant leader. Biblical submission isn't yielding to your husband's will, but embracing the order Christ gave and submitting to him. I want you to look in Colossians 3, and verse 18. We read Colossians 3 and 19 earlier, as Paul was talking to husbands. But in verse 18, he's talking to wives. He says, wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. And if you write in your Bibles, and it's not already cross-referenced, I would write in Ephesians 5, 22 to 24. And then in verse 19, if it's not cross-referenced, I would write in Ephesians 5, 25 to 33 as the role of husbands as the servant leader, as being the head of the household. Because it says, husband, love your wives and do not be embittered against them. Wives are to be subject to their husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Submission encourages your husband to fulfill his God-given role as servant leader. I want you to look at a few passages with me in the book of Proverbs. Let's keep a marker there in Ephesians 5. And look with me back in Proverbs. We're going to start in chapter 21. In Proverbs 21 and verse 9. It says, It's better to live in a corner of a roof than in a house shared with a contentious woman. Wives, don't be the contentious woman. You wonder, if you haven't seen your husband in a while and you find him on the roof, you might know why from reading Proverbs 21, verse 9. Don't be that contentious woman. Also, look in chapter 27, starting in verse 15. He says, A constant dripping on a day of steady rain and a contentious woman are alike. Does any wonder then in verse chapter 21 that he says it's better to be in a little part of the roof than to share the same roof with a contentious woman? Then in Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31, starting in verse 10, all the way through the rest of the chapter, verse 31, gives the description of the worthy woman or an excellent wife. And we're not going to read the whole part, but we're going to read with me verses 10 through 12, and then the last part in verses 28 to 29. It says, An excellent wife who can find, for her worth is far above jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he'll have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. Jump down to verse 28. Her children rise up and bless her. Her husband also, and he praises her, saying, Many daughters have done nobly, but you excel them all. He's saying, You are the best. And of all the women on the earth, you are the best. And husbands, that ought to be our attitudes towards our wives. She is the one that God has given to us to bless us in our lives. And we ought to have that attitude towards her. That we didn't make a mistake in marrying her. We, didn't, we don't pine after other women, but she, we need to say to our wives, you are the very best of the best. Her submission 
just like the husband's leadership, is a parallel to the church in Christ. Just as we read there in Ephesians, uh, or Colossians 3.18, Ephesians 5.22 and 24, and 1 Peter 3, 3 through 5. Look with me in 1 Peter chapter 3, 3 through 5. It's the one passage we didn't read out of that list. We read verses 1 to 2 and then 5 to 6. But read with me, starting in verse 3. It says, Your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry or putting on dresses. Many people take this passage out of context and say, see, if you're a Christian woman, you can't, you can't wear jewelry, you can't braid your hair. No, that's not the point of this passage. He says, not let it to be merely external. Verse 4 is the key. He says, but let it be the hidden person of the heart, with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. For in this way, in former times, the holy women also who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. See it? He's saying it doesn't matter how beautiful you are on the outside. Don't let that be your only beauty. Your beauty better be even more magnificent on the inside. Let it be that hidden person that is beautiful. It's a matter of the heart that the Lord sees. He says, adorn yourself with a gentle and quiet spirit. The hidden person of the heart. Or as I call it, adorning the heart. We adorn the heart with these characteristics that God is going to see and it's going to carry with us into eternity. Submission is mirrored. It's a pattern of the church as we see in Ephesians 5, 24 and verse 32. The church is to be in submission to Christ. So we see here in this just this short table, we see the role of the church is the church submits to Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1, 22, Ephesians 5, 24, wives submit to the husband. Colossians 3 and verse 18, Ephesians 5, 22. And Ephesians 5.33 tells us respect is put in practice. That a woman respects her husband. But then what about the woman that says, but he won't lead. You don't hold him accountable. That's for God. He's going to give an account to God if he did not lead because he is accountable to the Lord. He is to be the head of the family as Christ is the head of the church. And if he's not, then he's going to stand accountable to God. God did not say in that case that the wife can lead. I want you to look there in 1 Peter 3, 1 to 2 again. In the same way, you wives be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, that includes not being a leader. That includes not fulfilling the God-given role that he has as head of the family. Even if they're disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives, as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. That is going to be difficult. That's not going to be easy. That's why it's always important that we are very careful in the mate that we select to marry. For women, you're selecting a mate that you're going to willingly submit to. And he's, he might be wrong. Even the, if you pick the best mate, there's times that as husbands and as fathers we make mistakes we're going to be wrong. And that's why I said it's important that we seek forgiveness when that time happens. But women, as you're picking your mate to marry, you're picking someone that you're going to willingly put yourself in submission to his leadership. And if his leadership is, to be, is something to be desired while you're dating, then don't marry. Because if his leadership isn't there when you're dating, it won't be there when you're married. You need to be careful. Because you're going to submit to this man who's going to be the head of your family. And if he chooses not to be the head of the family, God says your role or your response is one of submissive. That you might win him over by your behavior. That you might not even have to say a word and win him over by your chaste and respectful behavior. Ultimately, a wife's submission is an issue between the wife and the Lord. Ephesians 5.22 Colossians 3, 18. We talk about that submissiveness is as in fitting as is, it is fitting in the Lord or as to the Lord. As we conclude, the role of a servant leader, the headship, never means asking your wife to disobey God. If you look at this umbrella, it kind of gives you the, the chain of command, so to speak. It is Christ who is over the husband. The husband's role is to protect his family, provide for his family. The wife's response to his headship is to be, is to bear children, to be managers of the home, to be submissive to the husband. The husband is submissive to Christ also. Let's not forget that. 
So the role of a servant leader never means asking your wife to do something that would disobey God. And the response of submission never means putting your husband before God. Well, my husband said it's okay, and I have to submit, and so I'm going to do what my husband said, even though God says do something different. No, submission does not mean that we get to just do whatever the husband says and not obey God. We, that's putting your husband before God. And that is not anything that we read of in the Scriptures. Each role and response is intended to fulfill Scripture, to honor God and bless your marriage. And when the home is in disarray, when the home is in disarray, the church won't be too far off. It won't be too far behind from following because it's a pattern that is mirrored. As we can see the, the home in the physical sense, we understand the church in the spiritual. And so if the home is an absolute wreck, the church won't be too far off from following. And we certainly have seen that in recent times, in our own lifetimes. Each role and response of spouses and marriage mirror the relationship of the church to Christ. In Ephesians 5.32, when the home is strong and functioning as God would have it, the church ought to be seen following suit. Notice in Ephesians 5, verse 32, Paul says what this whole passage, going back to verse 22, is really getting at. He says, this mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. He's talking about the role of the church to Christ. And to do that, to bring that point home, he's using something we can see in the physical of the relationship between the husband and the wife and how the family ought to be run. So when the home is strong and functioning as God would have it, the church ought to be seen following suit. Brethren, as we close, my admonition, my encouragement after studying such things and looking forward to part two as we talk about the God-given role of wives and the God-given response to husbands is let us strive to be the husbands and wives God wants us to be. The world is going to do it wrong. It always has. And no matter what the world does around us, no matter how they mock, how they sneer, we need to understand the proper way God intends the family to be run and make sure and ensure that we are doing it right. Make sure that we are fulfilling our roles and responses the way God would have us to be. This morning, if you're not a Christian, and then you need to be, you need to repent of your sins, recognize Christ is your Savior, that He died paying your debt of sin, and that your response to that great sacrifice is to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ that you might rise from the water, having those sins forgiven and washed away in His blood. No longer living for yourself, but living for the one that died and paid that great debt of sin. That is, Romans 6, 4 says, you might walk in newness of life. And this morning, if you're a Christian, perhaps not walking the way that you want, perhaps a wife or a husband not living with one another the way that you want, now's the time to remove that barrier between you and God. Now's the time to make correction. And if you're subject to invitation in any way, and if we can help you in any way, Come forward and let it be known now while we stand and while we sing.